Good afternoon, everyone. It is time for another episode of the Get to Know Her Show. I am your host, Monica Graves. I could not be more excited to be here today. I get to interview another one of my teen idols, you guys. Mae Potts from Boom 97.3 is with us today. You also will know her from Chum FM. And I, if we're going back to when I first found out about May, that was back in the CFNY spirit of radio days. Oh my gosh. There's so much to talk about. I am so, so excited for this. Uh, before we get started, I did want to talk to you about our sponsor, Brenda Badome, who is an amazing clothing designer. I actually have on some of her more vintage pieces because I was feeling kind of 80s today and I thought I needed to wear some hot pink and a little houndstooth jacket. And I've coupled these with our pride earrings that we're selling all through the month of June. Thank you guys so much for everyone who's gone to glamjewels.com to order uh, the pride earrings and help support Positive Space Network here in Halton and to help our LGBTQ youth here in the Halton area. You guys are awesome. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, Brenda Bedome. So I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but Back in January, she decided to give us all 21% off of her uh, website when you order and you have to use the coupon code get to know her and you're automatically going to get 21% off. So if you do need some lovely new clothes for your spring summer wardrobe, I would encourage you uh, to get over there to brendabadome.com and start shopping. So here we go. It's time to introduce May Potts. The coolest woman on radio, growing up with her upbeat, upbeat voice on my favorite radio station, CFNY 102.1. She made me realize in 1986, at the age of 17, that being positive and kind was hip and cool. I am so grateful for the influence that she had on me. Many of you know May today from Boom 97.3, where she hosts weekdays from 9.30 a.m. till 2 p.m. May has had an incredible, incredible career, and she says, you could say my path to radio officially started at Ryerson's radio and TV program, but I would say it started much earlier. I love this part. Almost every elementary report card said I was a fine student, but I talked too much in class. So hey, I was in early training. Combine that with a rabid love of music, encouraged by the records of older siblings, and it seemed inevitable. There is so much to talk to May about, including her interviews with many of our teen idols like David Bowie, George Michael, Depeche Mode, Chrissy Hind, Lou Reed, and so many more. I kind of wish I'd booked May for five hours, but I've got her for 45 minutes, and I'm so excited. I'm excited May! too! <laughs> yes! <laughs> it's so nice to meet you virtually like this. One day I'm hoping you'll be face to face. Oh, so do I, May. So do I. And you know, I it was really important to me for you to know the impact that you had on, you know, people my age growing up in the 80s in high school. And I still remember that awkward feeling of coming out of um, you know, grade eight, going into grade nine into high school, and then having like what station should I be listening to and what music should I be listening and what's cool and what's not cool and I remember all of the girls wearing like a lot of eyeliner and they had the short haircuts with the swoop to the side lots of blush and then the look was always like no smiling like people would walk down yeah. the hall like very cool right and I'm like that's not me like I couldn't help but smile at people and then when you came on the radio and your voice was so cheerful and so melodic, I, I'm not kidding you when I say this. I'm like, you can be cool and still be nice. Like here we have proof. This woman is amazing. So oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> I gotta tell you, it's really funny though, working uh, like I did with CFNY The Edge and I go to do a lot. I did a lot of live events. I worked in a lot of clubs and, and did things like that. So many people when they met me would say things, oh, you know, gee, I thought you'd have black hair. I thought you'd look a lot more goth. <laughs> and I was always like, well, I'm afraid to disappoint you. <laughs> I was like, but it's not my look. I and, love it. And, and then the funny thing too was, I mean, we were talking about going back to, you said 86, but in the yeah. 90s, I don't know if you remember, there was a period of time there where everything became, and I mean, not only music, but 
advertising and everything became very sarcastic and very, you know, yeah. like all the beer ads were like, yeah, whatever, have one of these, you know, like it was just yeah. very sort of, um, it was hip to be blase and, uh, and, and sarcastic. And yeah. I remember saying to one of my bosses, I said, you know, when happy comes back in, <laughs> I'm going to be cool. <laughs> That's so great. But it's it's just, uh, yeah, you just got to be who you are. And uh, that's what makes the job easier, no matter what you're doing, is if you can just sort of be yourself, right? Oh, that's such good advice. Exactly. You see, you were able to remain as a ray of sunshine through all of that, which I love. <laughs> so I have, I've got some fan stuff for you, May. Oh, my gosh. I, yes. Okay, okay. So first of all, I have something I have to show you. So this is my husband's. Oh, right on. And he was wondering if you could please sign it with your virtual pen for him. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but aren't the buttons awesome on that shirt? It is good. They're, yeah. But, uh, I've got a, a bunch of old, um, well, I guess old, but uh, yeah, yeah, previous uh, radio station t-shirts and things. And of course, you can't wear anything <laughs> when you're working for another station. You can't wear anything from those previous stations. No. So, uh, yes. Probably when I retire, I'll have nothing but a huge wardrobe of radio promo wear. <laughs> I love it. You know what I wish I'd kept? I had in 1982, I had the CFNY. It was like a bright shirt and it was kind of like, you know, the off the shoulder kind of look. Yeah. And it said CFNY 102.1, oh, yeah. the spirit of radio. And my best friend and I, we both had them and we'd wear them like twinsies with, with white shorts. And they were cropped. They were short yes. and quite stylish. That's they right. They were. They were amazing. Yeah. So I wish I'd kept that. If there's anything right. in the basement that you want to get rid of. <laughs> I'll take a look to see if I still have that. <laughs> That's so funny. So funny. So, and then uh, the, the other thing that I wanted to say before we went on, Rob Proust texted me, say hi to May. Oh, tell me. <laughs> yeah. Rob, who's now living at large in New York City, eh? He is. I know. New I know. Talent. Yeah. And, and also I'm so grateful to Nicholas Piklas who uh, brought us together and I've known oh. Nick since uh, high school. So, you know, 83 is when I met him and he wanted me to let you know that you ha were so kind to him and oh. so wonderful and it meant so much and it made a huge impact on his career, the way you welcomed him when he was oh, for a short time at CFNY. And where he's ended up with, he's done great too moving yeah. on to radio and stuff that's fantastic yeah so you have a lot of people who love you and i wanted to share this with you so probably can't really see it but i can't read what, it no what is no that? so it's a mixed tape of course ah. i did not make this tape myself my friend nicholas Piccolis, before he was nicholas Piccolis, made this tape for me with his friend uh they were djing all of our high school dances and there's some kind of weird songs on here so what I wondered if we could do is if I could list off 10 of the weird songs, They're not that weird, and see if you see if you remember the bands. Oh my gosh, this is going to be it's, tough. And I'm you know what, mate? Just before we start this, I want you yeah. to know that I had to Google them all because I was pretty sure I knew. And some of them, I'm, I was like, whoa, what the heck? I forgot all about this band. So if anything, if we if we can't, you can't remember, we're going to have a good laugh because okay, you're going to hear names you haven't heard in a while. I can't remember the names of people I knew from that part. I know. So we'll see what I know as far as bands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so the first song is Whisper to a Scream. Oh, Icicle Works. Yes, very Bird, good. Also, Birds Fly in brackets. Yes, Whisper yes. yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, Dancing in Heaven. Uh, Q Feel. Bravo. Thank you. <laughs> uh, what, spelled W-O-T. Captain Sensible. <gasps> oh my God, that's awesome. Good. Young Captain, say what? <laughs> Wasn't that good? I love that video. I put <laughs> yeah. Uh, Young Guns. Oh, um, that the alarm. No, it's a different one. I'll sing it to oh, you. Okay. Two guys, jean jackets. One of them passed away a few years ago. You actually interviewed him. Oh my gosh, I can't think of it. Wham! Remember Young Young Guns? Oh some my gosh. Yeah. That's yes, I, I know you knew oh, that one. Yeah, 
<laughs> uh, beatbox. Do you remember that one? Was it the Art of Noise beatbox? Yes. You about? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Secret. OMD. Yes. <laughs> the message. Um, well, Sugar Hill Gang. Or is there a different message? The message, Furious oh, Five, Flash. Grandmaster Flash. Furious Five. Yeah. Oh, I got the, yeah, that was wrong. Yeah, was I always wrong. get those two mixed up as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, come live with me. Remember that one? Live with me. That was, I had to Google that. I couldn't remember it. It's not Lords of the New Church, is it? No. No. Um, come live with me. Nope, not coming to me. Heaven 17. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was earlier. Uh, th this is another weird one. Do you remember Don't Try to Stop It? No, I don't remember that. That was one. Roman Holiday. That was probably a one-hit wonder. I think it might have yeah. been. I don't remember that one very well. <laughs> you know, a lot of these things, though, and I don't know if you're the same way. You, It goes yeah. out of your brain, but the minute you hear the song, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you can start singing yeah. along to even the lyrics, even though you haven't heard the song in like 30 years. That's it's the amazing. indelible thing about music, right? It's crazy. Yeah. Think, I don't know what that is. Sometimes people have requested something from me. And I'm like, oh, I don't know that song. And then I I bring it up and I'm like, oh yeah, that song. And then sing along. It's just crazy. Yeah, it's so yeah. crazy. It all stays in there. When I turned 30, which is over 30, uh, 20 years ago, my husband said, we need to do a test to see, uh, like I think I was the eve of being 29. He said, I'm gonna play you 30, 80 songs and only the first two notes. And I had to guess them all and I got them all, no problem. But that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it, on a more serious note, you take that to the side. Um, they have found with with uh, people who suffer from Alzheimer's or dementia oh. that the thing that often brings them back is music. So they may not so, always be in the moment, but when they start hearing songs, there's a connection that happens. So the power of music is so everlasting and so strong, you know. It is. It's absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. So one more song. Are you ready? This is oh, the last okay. one. Heroes never die. Heroes never die. Well, when I think heroes, the only thing I think of is Bowie, but I know that's not the Bowie one. No. No, no. And it's a, it's Q feel again. It was it. Yeah. It was, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I would have yeah, yeah. remembered that. But yeah. Uh, Dancing yeah. in Heaven, actually, I just recently had a request for. Um, oh, somebody called me at Boom asking for that one. And I said, I'm going to have to dig that up for you because I know I have that on a CD or something here at home. Yeah. But I think I only have it off a Greatest Hits package. So okay. it would be that one song, not the other yeah. one you just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so amazing, like CFNY back in the day. Like, that's it was so obscure, you know? It, I love that station because you could hear all these weird songs that were like it was like somebody was really digging all the time and 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 nothing ever repeated in a whole day right like alternative music which i thought was fast like how did they even do that you know i know and then so the many... interesting thing is when i started there and most radio stations um the, the announcers do not program their own music that's what you have a music department for and a music programmer for is that they put the right. songs in for the day and when i started at cfny it was the and, and that was already in the way it was when I started at CFNY. But they were a little bit freer in that during the day, you still had to fit in certain categories. They'd give you a music sheet and you'd have to play like a new song, a gold song, a Canadian song. And you'd have to go through the list. But they allowed you to pick oh. whatever from the library, long as it fit those categories. And that was very unusual because that wasn't the case in most stations. As yeah. far as the new music and the popular stuff, they did have it in bins. So in other words, when Sinead O'Connor's album, The Lion and the Cobra came out, they yeah. wanted songs from that being played okay. fairly regularly, but they would say, okay, you know, play something from this, but you wouldn't have to play the exact same things as somebody else. And okay. when I was on overnights, it was even freer. When I was first hired, I was allowed to bring records from home. And that was unheard of in, in radio, that you can just bring whatever. So, um, you know, doing the overnights there was really amazing because not only did I work with the CFNY library, I, whatever, if they didn't have something that I wanted and I had it at home, I could bring it in and nobody would question me playing. Oh my God, that's incredible. It, wow. you know, it was an incredible time, a very different time. And yeah. uh, it was, I was very privileged to still have that opportunity before things changed to, to have that experience with them, you know? Yeah, must have been so exciting. So May, I have to ask you, 
I ask all my guests this question. I We all want to know what little May wanted to be when she grew up. And I'm so glad you asked this because I think there's a lot yeah. of people that are the same as me as I didn't know. I don't think I ever had that thing of I'm going to do this. And, yeah. um, and I think a lot of people feel bad because they don't have that answer. When, mm. when they're being asked, like, I mean, especially when they get into high school and they're being always asked, mm. what do you want to be? What do you want to do? And I think it's really hard to figure that out when you think about the options that are out there in the world and what kind of a life you think you may want to live, which you don't really know when you're that that age. I do mm. remember taking theater and I loved theater. And so I thought I wanted to, to be an actor. And I remember my drama teacher taking me aside and saying, you know, that's great, you know, and, and it's not that I'm not encouraging you to do that, but just keep in mind that the life of an actor is very difficult and can be a very hungry life. In other words, you're not always working. And, um, and that's when I kind of went, yeah, okay, well, maybe I'll take um, some sort of media training so that as I get ready to maybe take acting courses, that I can also have a background in television production or or something else that I can do while maybe pursuing also acting. So that is really how I ended up at Ryerson taking the radio and TV program. And yeah. um, and, and you know and then there was also you know stuff in between there where you take I took like modeling courses and did a little bit of tiny bit of modeling, not not very much. Um, but when I did the media or the radio and TV program at Ryerson, uh, the first year they used to be divided as the first year's exclusively radio. And I really enjoyed it. And the, and the teacher, uh, one of the teachers there really encouraged me to get involved with the campus radio station. He said, you, you seem to be sort of a natural uh, for doing this. And I thought, yeah, okay, well, I'll, I'll join the campus radio station, which was CKLN which was 88.1 eventually, which is now, of course, Indie, which is sort yeah. of a licensing change and everything. But uh, after that first year, yeah, I dis I discovered radio. I had not grown up thinking, like listening to other people on the radio, going, oh yeah, that's what I wanna do. Um, not to say that I didn't listen to radio and love it. I just mm -hmm. wasn't on my radar really, which is kind of interesting because I did love music um, wow. But it just didn't connect with me. And then in the second year, when we did um, some television production work, I thought, you know what? I'm not really loving this. Uh, I didn't really care for TV as much as radio. And so then it sort of became a thing where I really started focusing on radio. And uh, yeah, and that's how that happened. So. <laughs> Gosh, that's amazing. You know, I love what you said in your bio about talking too much in class. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because that's often what like i i heard this once when you're trying to figure out what it is you want to do with your life and like you said i think that's such a great answer like not knowing you know like some people are like i want to be a police officer other people yeah. no clue you know they think they know but and and also things change and god the kids now like at 17 18 needing trying to figure out what they want to do at university i can't even imagine yeah. when no, i was I that no, but but I heard once that you should look at what you were really good at and really yeah. loved and not minimize anything. So they even this article I read even said that if you were the one on the phone with all your friends, organizing parties, chatterbox in the classroom, like all this kind of thing, yeah. you need to those are also very important uh, characteristics to consider when you're, you know, trying to choose a career, like. Absolutely, you know? and so for yeah. someone like me who was a yacker and likes people, that could have meant sales, that could have meant public relations, that could have meant so many myriad of different things, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, marketing and working with clients. And so it, it ended up being broadcasting um, and yeah. I love it. And, and it, it just did work for me and I've never, wanted to really stray from it now that I've been into it. But there are many people who then also feel, even if they do know what they wanna do, um, when they go into it, it maybe isn't what they thought. Mm. And then they feel sort of tied into it because they did you know, go to school for this and they're doing okay in this job. And so I, I, all, 
I agree that with that other person said is think about what you're good at, but also think about what you like to do. And it doesn't always have to start off being a career pursuit. It can start off being a hobby. If you love taking pictures, maybe take, you know, maybe work your job, but also do some photography courses. Mm -hmm. It's funny how life can lead you into things when you are pursuing or doing things you love and have a natural perhaps affinity for, um, because sometimes you don't know what the jobs are that are related to that. But by pursuing those things, you will start meeting people that are like-minded and can open your eyes to opportunities that you didn't even know existed. Yeah, amazing. I would love for you to tell us this story about about how you got to CFNY. So CFNY was your second job, correct? Well, if we're not counting um, Ryerson. Right, no, there was a yeah. period in between. So I graduated right. from Ryerson and um, it was a, it was so hard to, to get a job even in broadcasting then. It always has been, it's a very competitive industry. So mm -hmm. I didn't have a job. I was still working at the campus radio station and I couldn't get a job in radio initially. So I kept working at Walters Jewelers and the Eaton Centre, which is what I did from the time I was about 16. I was working retail and jewellery. And I always wow. worked with jewellers who made jewellery on the premises initially. So I know, you know, I thought when you said you make jewellery, I yeah. said, well, I can relate. <laughs> I know a lot about it. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> so with, great. I worked was with it? beautiful jewellers and things. So, um, so for a year, I was doing that. And it was only by chance that someone said, hey, there's this radio station in Brampton CKMW that's looking for Rhythm Radio 790. They're looking for an overnight person. And um, I got that job. And then that was down the hall from CFNY, that radio station. They okay. used to be the same owners. They weren't when I got there, but they were still in the same building, which was 83 Kennedy Road South. It's a strip mall. Both radio stations were on the upper level of that. And um, so I worked at CKMW for almost two years, I think it was. It was a great opportunity and I met great people there. And as a matter of fact, Scott Turner was there when I got there, who also, he went to CFNY and then I followed him there too. But Scott Turner was at CKMW, uh, Craig Venn, who's uh, a broadcaster now, he was at CKMW. So uh, I worked there and I ended up moving up from overnights to middays and music director. And then they changed their format to Italian. And I oh, <laughs> they were multicultural in English. Dance oh my field. gosh. But then they went all multicultural really with, with Italian. And I was like, okay, yeah. well. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. If you wanted Estonian, I can speak Estonian, but I can't do uh -huh. Italian. So I was gone. Then I was out of work for a bit, but I had already established quite a relationship with CFNY. Um, because I was always down the hall and, and I even did voice work for them uh, because they're always looking for female voices for commercials and stuff like that. So yeah. um, it was David Haydu, also known as Geats, who called me when there was an overnight opening for CFNY for Friday and Saturday nights. And I'd been out of work again, like from CKMW. It was over a year before I I'm back to the jewelry store. So um, <laughs> yeah. <Wow. Good laughs> so then you. I yeah, then about a year, year and a half later is when I got in at CFNY, and uh, that was that was just the most incredible uh, bit of news for me. I, I love telling this to people that when um, I was looking, when I applied for that job, I was also having to move. I had to change apartments. Mm -hmm. And when you are looking for an apartment and they ask you where you work, and I really didn't have much to say, I had like this part-time jewelry store job. I was like, oh, so I had the interview with CFNY with David Marston and he was so nice. And he says, oh, May, you know, everybody's been coming in saying, you know, we know that May's applied and, you know, you should hire her. And he said, but, you know, I can't hire you on a popularity basis. He says, I do have to do some of their interviews. I'm like, OK. Oh, jeez. <laughs> When I remember calling Leslie, his assistant, and saying, Leslie, has he made a decision yet? Because I'm still looking for an apartment. I'd really like to say that I have a full-time job. <laughs> and the next day or later that day, I get a phone call. It's from David Marston. And he says, he's got, I love the way David Marston speaks. You you know, he's got that nice, slow, comforting way of speaking. And he says, hello. And I go, hi, David. And he says, I hear you're looking for an apartment. And I thought, okay, so maybe he has an apartment he wants to rent me. <laughs> and he said, 
<laughs> well, he says, I understand how challenging that can be when you're looking and they want to know where you work. So the next time they ask you where you work, you tell them that you work at CFM. Oh. And I just lost it. Oh <laughs> so my excited. God. Thank you, thank you. And, and I, I think he called me on a Wednesday. I started that oh. Friday. It was just all a whirlwind. And oh. some of the best years of my life came up from that. So it was great. That is such a great story. I love that. Talk about torture. Were you yeah, like, get no, to the point, get to the point. <laughs> I had still been doing my CKLN show Friday nights from nine till midnight. It was called the Go Go Show, and it was a very rhythmic kind of show. And they were so cute because I felt horrible. I'd been there for like six years at this campus station, and I said yeah. to them, "Listen, I said I just got the job at CFNY, but they want me to start Friday. I don't want to leave you in a lurch, but I can't do the show." So they said, "Don't you worry about it." So that night, oh. leading up from like nine till midnight, was what my Go Go Show was. They had people filling in saying, hey, we're here for May because she's going to be on CFNY at midnight. Tune into her. She's got a job. It was the most, I got to tell you, that that's the heartwarming thing about radio. It really is yeah. a very endearing and wonderful community. And people really do cheer each other on for success. And uh, oh. I definitely felt that. <laughs> that is incredible. So overnight, it started at midnight. And then how yeah. long would you go? Like till six in the morning or? Uh, 530 or something like that. Yeah, five or six. Do you yeah. know what? It's really funny. I've just been um, going through old tapes and things mm -hmm. uh, because there has been talk about some sort of a CFNY um, documentary being put together. So I was asked to look through what I had. And I'm horrible for keeping stuff. I really am. I've, I'm so stupid. But in hindsight, I should have kept so many things that, that I didn't. But of, uh, but of, among the things that I found, which I haven't listened to yet, is my very first night on air at CFNY. I found that cassette. So I'm kind of mortified to listen to it because when I have listened to old tapes, I'm always going, geez, how do I ever get a job in radio? Listen to it. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Oh, oh somebody my. hear something in that, but good for that. <laughs> I heard it. I heard the magic. Oh, and your voice, you know, like coming out of the club at midnight, we got to listen midnight. to you on our rides home. And I mean, you were with all of us. You're oh, amazing. The midnight shift is so special. And it's unfortunate yeah. that. Uh, it, it's, in a lot of ways, it's not that much of a, a big deal anymore. A lot of stations don't even have overnight jocks anymore because it's a really special shift. I loved it when I did it because you feel like you're part of some sort of subculture. Um, yeah. It's not just people from clubs and stuff. There's people that work overnight shifts and everybody who works an overnight shift is living a subculture. You're not in sync with the rest of the world at all. Right. So. Yeah. The you know the band of brothers and sisters on overnights has a real special connection. So for someone who worked in radio and people were calling me and I was playing their songs, it was really fantastic. Oh, yeah. I love that! And so you were in your twenties during that time, I yes, guess. That's, yeah. yeah. What an amazing experience! You were like Venus. You were like the Venus flytrap of Toronto, man. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've been very fortunate. And then, you know, the CFNY years were great. And then I've just been so blessed to, to move on to some other great radio stations too. Yeah. And a good chunk of those years at all of those stations, CFNY too, was middays for um, eight years at, at CFNY. And then, you know, a number of years at Chum and now middays again at Boom. And I yeah. love it. I'm sort of but, like the midday, the midday person, midday man. Yeah. The midday May. I love it. I love it. You the because you bring the sunshine. That's where you belong. Oh, yeah. Sweet. Very sweet. <laughs> oh God. So May, I have to share with you. I remember uh, in high school, like our dances were all DJed by Nicholas pretty much. And right. then CFNY started doing these video dances. Mm -hmm. And that was my l later years of high school. So that would have been like, I think 86 and 87, we would mm -hmm. have these CFNY video dances. Right. And there was one year where they had Don Burns was emceeing it. Oh, this good. was my best. I think it was my last high school dance. I was in grade 13. It was the best night. Don Burns was emceeing and Martin Streak was turning the like That's spinning right. the records right yeah and i was like you know i was 18 or whatever and they had a contest for the biggest earrings 
<laughs> and I won it because my earrings were like these giant silver hoops, but thick, you know, and like they were really, really yeah, exactly. So, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Don Burns, he brought me up on stage and everybody cheered. And he was like, how many uh, satellite stations can you get in on those earrings there, girl? And it was just so fun. And then that night I ended up dancing all night with Martin Streak. And I even Aww. stole a little kiss at the end of the night. Oh, Marty! <laughs> Ever the pleaser of the crowd, he he was just yeah. so great posting those things. He just yeah. was great, and he was the head of the road show. He was always yes. out with them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I remember going to the road shows, and that was a big loss uh, when he passed, Martin. Oh, awful! Yeah, yeah. it was yeah. very hard. and Dawn too. You know, it's it's yeah. hard to miss. We miss these people. We love them and mm -hmm. work together but there was a bond there that was a little bit different than you know sometimes the co-workers have we you know we yeah. were all a pretty tight bunch yeah yeah for sure so mm -hmm. you know what i'm really curious about is your short stint with mojo radio like oh, yeah. here you are in this all man all male uh station yeah, that was um, an interesting time. Well, what happened was yeah. they were changing things at CFNY. So um, there was, everybody was being moved on that had been there. So um, Alan Cross was moved to, to I think, Y95 y or whatever. He went out to Hamilton from there. Humble and Fred were being moved on. They were going to Mojo. Um, I was asked to move on and they didn't really have a place for me at first. And they said, well, you know, do you want to work? Do you want to stay on air? Do you want to move into promotions? And and uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do other than being on air. And um, so I was in a, in a position where I, I was sort of thinking about stuff. And then Stu Myers, who had been my PD at The Edge and who was now going to start Mojo, he yeah. offered me the Mojo Magazine show from noon to two. And it was going, it, it was, just a variety of different topics through the day. And I hadn't done talk radio before. And because I didn't have a definitive place where I wanted to go, mm -hmm. I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to give it a shot. Now, the concept of it being talk radio for guys, yeah. I don't think I really understood where they were going to go with this. Um, I did I did understand the, the direction to a degree. But I do know that when I got there too, a lot of the topics that I would want to do or that I brought up, they were like, well, that's not really, you know, that's not going to really hit the target. And I said, but guys like this stuff too. And they're like, yeah, no. So I think that there was, I wasn't quite in step with um, their definition of what maybe guys would want to hear or talk about. There was an mm -hmm. awful lot uh for me to learn, it was a big learning curve about sports because I definitely not a sports person. And I all of a sudden was with this magazine show talking to, um, you know, coaches and players and, you know, wow. it was, it was great. It was, like I said, it was, it was a great experience mm -hmm. and I am thankful that I had it. The other thing that happened, we launched in May. Well, that was 2001. So if you remember, September 11th happened. And to be in talk radio when that happened, oh. well, in any media, everything changed. The, the world changed. And we weren't necessarily talking anymore about basketball or hockey or anything. It was all about, you know, terrorism yeah. and what had happened uh, with 9-11. So that was a real learning curve, too. But there I was a little bit uh, more comfortable because... I was in the same situation as the listeners. We didn't, we had never heard of Al Qaeda before. And we had never, so my questions and my lack of knowledge was mirrored with, to a certain degree with the listeners. So I could ask the questions on air of, from military experts and things. And, and we were learning together. Ultimately, it wasn't the right place for me. And they did move me on. And of course, well, they let me go. Actually, they didn't move me on. They laid me off from Mojo. But this, the format itself struggled and it didn't mm -hmm. end up lasting anyway. Okay. But regardless, I, 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 you know, applaud them for trying something different. And, mm -hmm. and I am grateful for the opportunity that it gave me to try something different too, and that was talk radio. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I applaud you for trying something different because that's so out of your realm of oh even my God, it was so your <laughs> interest. Like it just show it must have empowered you to, it must have made you realize like, regardless of what the subject matter is, I really know what I'm doing in this. Well, 
right? Like, yes, no, I don't think I really knew everything that I was doing. Really? I love I, the fact that it gave me the opportunity to to try things, something completely mm -hmm. different. It was a very scary thing because unlike in music radio, when things, when there's nothing to talk about, or or if not nothing to talk about, but when, when you finish saying what you're gonna say, there's a song. Or if you have mm -hmm. to move on, you play music. In talk radio, you yes. have to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> if people aren't calling in or if they're not talking a lot, wow. you have to fill that space and yeah. do something with it. So my hat's off to people who uh, can do that and do it right. in an engaging way. People who work in talk radio, really, that's a that's a skill set. So good on them. Yeah, that's amazing. So May, from there, now you're with Chum and yeah. then Boom. And so so now you're interviewing like a lot of celebrities as well, right? But which you mm -hmm. had done at CFNY also. That's great. Yeah. But uh, th that's so great. So you, I, I'm wondering, like, is there any person you interviewed where you were just kind of like, oh my God, like, the the wind was taken from you know you couldn't believe you were sitting with this person was there anybody oh, like that where you were quite starstruck several. there's several so if we go back yeah. to and why years um gosh um, well i'll tell you chrissy hine from the pretenders was one of them because i remember the first time i saw the pretenders at masonic temple or concert hall whatever it was called back then yeah. um she was she was unlike any woman I'd seen performing. She was like this rocking chick at the helm of a rock band. She was incredible. Yeah. So for me, as a female, in and at, at back then in the early '80s, it was there's, you know, the industry yeah. wasn't as progressed as it is now. So no. it was just like, wow, she's amazing. So having a chance to interview her, I was very nervous because I also, I get nervous around people who don't take crap in a way because you read about things that Chrissy yeah. Hine does and stuff and if she doesn't, you don't ask the right question, she'll like, so a yeah. <laughs> little bit, a uh, little bit apprehensive, but that went very well. Lou Reed, the same thing. I was very nervous, but just, oh my God, it's Lou Reed. Yeah. <laughs> so that, those were a couple. So many interviews from the CFNY years still stand out to me. Mm -hmm. um, Elvis Costello stands out for a bad reason, and that is because I interviewed him at the Four Seasons Hotel. The interview went great for uh, for the station, but it was only when I got back and was listening back that I found out that my microphone connection was loose. So the whole interview, all I heard was every third syllable. So it was just a bust. Because <laughs> back then you had to like plug in the little mic thing. Yeah, it was just I didn't know it was faulty. So yeah, there was that. Later when I got to um, Chum, it was great because I got to do interviews, but it was a whole different kind of set of artists. So it was mm -hmm. George Michael and it was, um, you know, Kelly Clarkson and Alicia Keys. Madonna yeah. was terrifying. I flew to New York to interview her and that was, uh, I was the last interview of a day of press. And again, you know, she's known for being the kind of person that can, you know, be difficult or not want to answer yeah. questions. But I think it went okay. We got through that. Beyonce uh, to, to, to interview her. So it's neat because, wow. you know, it depends where you work, the opportunities that are presented to you. Um, That's yeah. great. You know who I'd love to know? Um, I would love to know uh, how it was to interview George Michael. That interview uh -huh. was incredible because he yeah. hadn't recorded or done any interviews um, up until that point for a, a number of years. He'd sort of been off the radar. So was this, it the last time he was here, May, that you interviewed him? Like when no, he line before that. So I think oh, it was okay. like 2000, I'm trying to remember the year, but it was like 2000, maybe three or four, something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it was an interview that we were doing. Um, I was here in Toronto, he was in, in London, and it was, you know, via lines, phone lines and stuff. Okay. The quality was fantastic. It felt like we were in the same room audio wise, but we weren't. <laughs> and um, it just, it was supposed to be, um, I think a, a 15 or 20 minute interview. He, what, he had his handlers there, they always do. And they always tell you, you have X amount of minutes. And mm -hmm. then they start giving you the rap signals. It's not the artist, it's their, their handlers and everybody who sort of control all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the ones also that will often tell you, don't ask this and don't do that. Now, George Michael didn't have anything like that. Um, 
But when I sat down to interview him, there was just something between us. It doesn't always happen. And it, it's very hard to make it happen when you're not in person. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, him we just connected. And it was one of the best interviews of my career. And I could tell that he loved it because we went, uh, I don't even know, 40, 45 minutes. It was supposed to be like 15, 20. It, as a matter of fact, it's the only interview that I finally... I was like, oh my gosh, I've got nothing left to ask. I'm gonna, ha I'm gonna have to wrap wow. this up. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> incredible! Everything. Uh, he was really amazing, um, and I, 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 and I'll tell you something. I don't know if you feel this way because you do interviews and you also mm -hmm. watch interviews and and hear them. And don't you feel when an artist is giving or kind that you like them more afterwards? Oh so, God. So totally. if they're, if they come across as difficult or rude or whatever, there's something about it afterwards where you kind of go, hmm. you know, when they have a new song or something, you just don't love it quite as much anymore. Yeah, You dismiss it a little. And then, you know so, what? You don't, yeah. you try not to, you try to be objective, but yeah. you know, how people make you feel is very important. So important. So I have to share with you, I, I, was lucky enough to interview Sandy Horn from the Spoons. And I saw that. That's oh, good. Yeah, that was great. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so in love with you. Like same feeling I'm having towards you, May. I'm just like, I'm so in love with you now. And and um, years ago, I actually connected with uh, Taylor Kay, who you know from Chum. Yeah, right. And sh she introduced me to the gang at Much Music and got me involved in the gift lounge where I was oh, giving fun. away my jewelry for the MMVA. And so that was in 05 and 06. And I met um, I met Fergie from Black Eyed Peas. I met um, all kinds of different people. Uh, Amy Lee from Evanescence. But you're right. You know who? They were all lovely. I think there was one person who was kind of rude, and it wasn't a it wasn't a woman. It was a man. But and I'm I was just like I know that feeling. I was like eh, I couldn't be bothered with them. Like right. But but. Uh, <laughs> But Amy Lee, I remember her coming in the room and and it's so fast you get like this photo op. You know what it's right like, right? Yeah. Like all these people are trying to get the photos and you just want that one photo op. So Amy Lee is standing with me and we're talking about her album and music and blah, blah. And I said, and at the same time, Paris Hilton is walking into the gift lounge. And I said to her, I'm like, Amy, I don't want to hold you up, but everyone's taking pictures of Paris. Like, I don't know when they're going to get back to us. She goes... I could talk to you all day. I'll totally oh. just hang with you. And I was like, oh my God, you will? She goes, yeah, and we'll get some really cool pictures. Like, what necklace do you want me to wear? And now whenever I see her, I just feel like she's my friend, you know? Yeah. Like, she probably doesn't even remember me. <laughs> but it was so, it, it makes a huge difference. It, it to does. always be kind to people, it's so important. No matter what you're going through, like, mm. you know, it, and it it's matters. interesting too because you know the the opportunities for me have continued even at Boom ninety seven three to do interviews and when you you were asking me earlier about people that sort of like you you are blown mm -hmm. away, um, we've had a great opportunities with um, not only interviews for that come on my show but also for our feature we have called Behind the Vinyl which is a really great feature yes. that Boom does uh, where we get artists to sit down with their vinyl a, a vinyl copy of their song they drop the needle on the record and. During the song playing, they can they talk about their memories or whatever they want to share associated with that. It's a great feature, and it's at boomedy73.com if anybody wants to check it out. And I think we've even got a podcast with it now, so the Behind the Vinyl podcast. But I'm going to go back to to somebody who blew me away and who was also extremely giving. And it was just a couple of years ago that he came in was Bob Geldof, Sir Bob <gasps> Geldof, and I had wow. him on air with me, and. You know, he was the kind of guy that I would ask a question and he just made it so easy. He just would go on and talk about all sorts of stuff. And then he stayed and did pictures with everyone. And, you know, just to be oh. gracious like that when he didn't, you know, he could have just made everything very businesslike and quick yes. and moved on. And, and that's what we would have expected and still had great admiration for him, but he mm -hmm. went that extra distance. And I sure love that, that mate. I, I saw the picture of you and Bob. I loved it. And you know what? Um, how amazing, given what he's been through in his right. life, 
Oh my God. Like one tragedy after the other. I mean, yeah. God, you know, that's, that's so wonderful that he's such a gracious man. And yes, he yeah. is he's great. And you don't always Amen. know until you meet people, they can seem a certain way, but he was just, um, like I said, he gave more than was expected and it was greatly appreciated. It's such a oh. thing now too, the pictures, right? Like that's another yeah. funny thing. When we talk about going back to the eighties and even the nineties, all these artists that I met and, or interviewed, not only was I horrible with not always keeping my tapes and stuff, but we didn't have documentation. Like that's the funny thing we're no. talking now about these documentary yeah. that maybe we'll be doing. We didn't do pictures. The only time a picture ever came up with you and an artist was maybe if the rep from the record company thought to take a picture or something. There was right. really anything like that. Now that's all that it's about. It's almost like, you know, you don't even, nobody asks for autographs or anything anymore either. It's all like they do, but not the same way it's all about the right. picture right yeah it is yeah. all about the picture you're right and we didn't have like even if you let's say you ran into a celebrity by chance you didn't have a phone to whip out and take yes. a photo with it was just like oh my god is anybody oh, even gonna believe me very funny when Steve was in town to do um his show uh the last the last ship I'm trying to remember the, also my drawing a blank on the name but he was in town in toronto doing um a show with the mervishes and there was a press thing done and uh, we were able to go and be part of this press conference. And they were all like, no pictures, no pictures, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine, we know no pictures. Well, Jennifer Valentine and I are sitting side by side. She was a massive, she's a massive stink fan. So we're leaving and as we're leaving, he walks past us and she goes, let's go. So we went <laughs> outside. He was on his way to his limo and we weren't supposed to, but we totally, we, we figured he was out of the building now. So the, everything was over. Yeah. It was fair game. So she just jumps in and says, Sting, I'm such a huge, huge fan. Can I please get a picture? So she got one and I'm like, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so we got our pictures with Sting. It was pretty great. But That's yeah, there's often those situations where you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that story. That's we good. Were total fans. We were fans at the side of the theater, running out, chasing him to <laughs> his limousine, just like a couple of 14-year-old girls. <laughs> Jennifer Valentine and I. That is really funny. That's perfect. I love that. And you know what? That must be so great about being in this industry, too. The 14-year-old girl lives on forever. Like, you're not... <laughs> She's never going away. No, well, when you yeah. love music and you're a fan, it just, yeah. it's there. It just is always there. You know what it is, too? I'll be honest with you. Um, I'm still in total awe, <clears throat> pardon me, of people that create music because I'm not, yeah. I'm not able to do that. You know, uh, I, I am mesmerized when I think about the fact that someone can, just from in their head, create an idea and make something that brings so much joy and sounds so wonderful there's there's those of us who aren't artistic or creative in that way it's a mystery how you they how they do that so that's why we, i think we're in awe of artists because many of us cannot fathom how they can do that i it's, know it's it is it's it's pure magic really yeah. like yeah it it's, really it's is beyond talent i mean talent is is also something to be greatly admired but it's just the, the fact that they can create something from nothing and make make it something so special. Yeah, yeah absolutely amazing. May I have to ch share with you, uh, I'm totally crazy about Daryl Hall since I was 12. Oh yeah. <laughs> have you ever met him? No, no, I have not. Do, do you I ever watch uh, live from Daryl's house? Have you ever oh, watched that? Those? Is a great feature. Isn't I've it amazing? A lot of them. I haven't seen yeah. all of them, but there's, they're fantastic. Yeah, yeah, they're good. And I feel like I don't correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like when I listened to you as a teenager, you were also a fellow Roxy Music fan. Yes, love. Yeah, Roxy okay. Roxy music. Yeah, yeah. He was at Messy Hall a few years ago and and I was still there just yeah. you know loving on him. <laughs> oh, he's amazing that Avalon yeah. album. And and also I remember I think it was when you were with like when you were on after Humble and Fred is that when you mm -hmm. had your daughter? Yes, my yes, yes. Well, my daughter was okay. born in '89, so she's okay. a Y baby. She came yeah. to the station all the time and would come up yeah. to Wilson Park and Barry sometimes with me. <laughs> and at the day celebrations and That's stuff. So sweet. She, 
she definitely grew up. And, well, and also too, if you remember, um, I'm not sure if you ever came down when CFNY uh, had their street level studios. Those, the first ones were, yeah. the first studio was at Bloor and Bathurst. And that was, I think, 92, 93. And that was when I went to Middays. And I yeah. was right after Humble and Fred. But Humble and Fred were still out in Brampton. I went and worked at the Bloor and Bathurst studios. And the way the Bloor and Bathurst studio was set up, it was a very long, skinny, you know, I think it was formerly a, some kind of, a, I don't know if it was a store or a restaurant. But so it, when it was redesigned for us, I was in the window, more or less. I was near the front. Like, so yeah. when you people walked in, there was a little bit of a space and then it was the actual board set up. And, um, and then behind me was the, the promo desk and the promo people. So we had it set up that the midday show would be broadcast from there. So sometimes she would come with me. She, when she was little, before it was school years, she would come and hang out with me down at the, at the radio station while I was oh. on air. Um, but the funny thing was when people would come in to pick up their prizes, they would have to walk past me. But when they walked in, they thought I was the prize person because oh. of the <laughs> person there. So they always <laughs> went, hi, can I um, pick up my prize? I won tickets for whatever. And I'd be like, yeah, sure. I said, but you have to ask Noni. She's in the back. She'll have that for you. And then when I would go on the air, they'd be like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking it's so weird to see your lips moving and seeing you because of course yeah back then radio also wasn't as visual it is as it is now that's like, right zoom and pictures and everything so yeah they were, yeah they would be pretty taken aback by that that was fun and then they, they also did the live in toronto show from from down there as well and that was great yeah. because artists would come in and fans could come in off street level to um to watch the interviews and things too so that was me that's so neat wow yeah and i remember that i remember when you were pregnant and i remember you sharing it all with us the listeners and it was so yes. exciting and then you were off to have your baby and then you came yes. back i came back yeah. and then she followed me into radio and has done so many great things uh, she's a terrific music programmer that's what she's into oh. she's uh, not necessarily as interested in on air but uh definitely yeah. loves music programming and that's what uh she's been doing over the years yeah oh good for her tell her i want to have her on my show i'd okay. love to interview her <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's so cool so may um i wanted to ask you also about radio trailblazers because you're a spokesperson for them mm. uh can you tell us a little bit about the rosalie award uh, honoring women in media and your involvement in that? So the Rosalie Award was created well before I became involved with it. It was really the brainchild of Liz Janik and it's it's gone on to become a much, you know, a, a much respected and, and big award in the industry. It's always now tied in with Canadian Music Week. And um, at one point they asked me to come down and, and host a night. And um, one of the awards nights, and uh, I did. And, and it's usually now a two component event. The Radio Trailblazers have their own event where we uh, get together and we invite women, and, well, and not just women, but all sorts of people from the industry to come in and be a part of uh, our actual awards night. And then there's the other component where we actually are also up on stage during Canadian Music, uh, Canadian music Week during those awards. But okay. um, it's it was, such an honor to be asked just to host. And then it was one of those things where they kept asking me to come back. So I became more or less, I think it's been almost, I'm trying to think how many years, maybe almost a decade that I've been hosting the event and being involved with them as, as a spokesperson. Great group of people. And it's such an important award because it's taken a long time for women to make their way and make a mark in, all sorts of industries, but definitely also in uh, radio and in broadcasting. So, you know, the on air component has been more visible. We've been, um, I think from the, there's always been some women on air, but there's definitely been since my time, uh, an exponential growth of the number of women that are represented on air. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it would be fair to say that we're still looking to see growth in other areas of broadcast for women. And that is more in the uh, management upper and the upper echelons of the industry. It is happening. Yeah, uh, Everything happens, but it just happens so slow. I know, God, <laughs> yeah. I think that's what, you know, I think that's one of the challenges that we see is that 
yes, there is advancement, but it's just uh, a little bit longer, taking longer than yeah. any of us would like. Aw, well, you're so inspiring. I'm sure, <laughs> you know, any young women who are in this industry watching now, they're, you know, having people like you sharing your story, I think it's so important because- Well, the women and the men now, they're the game changers and that's great. Mm. And it's both of them, you know, it's its everybody in the, that's, that's gonna have an impact on how we all move forward. And, and it is an exciting yeah. industry. And there is, like I said, it's always getting better. So um, I'm really just very thrilled to be a part of it. Oh, that's so great. May, I wanna talk to you all day. <laughs> so- <laughs> That's funny. Let's have dinner together. Um, I yeah, um, probably a lot more interesting than a lot of other people. I'm sure that a lot of people are going, yeah, no, we've heard enough now. That's good. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> no way. I doubt it. I doubt we'll it. We'll talk about jewelry at some point, you and I. Yes, you we do will. Your background in jewelry and my little bit of knowledge about it. So Yeah, we will. We'll have to chat jewelry. So I want to invite you to a little 10-minute after party on Instagram. If mm -hmm. uh, if I can have just a few more minutes of your time, that would be awesome. But I'm so grateful for you for taking the time and coming Thank on you. right after your shift, after talking yes, all day. People will join me on my shift too. And you know what the best part about my shift, Monica, is that it is so interactive. And that's what I love about radio is the fact that the, the wall between me and the listeners isn't really there. So I have the opportunity to do a feature called Mixtape of You, where people make a mixtape yeah. and then, you know, we draw and then we connect and we talk about those songs that people love. Oh. That's every day at 1025. And then the Boombox All Request Lunch from 12 to 1, where, you know, every day I'm taking requests, emails, texts, phone calls, and playing as yeah. many of these requests as possible. The people that listen to radio in this city and actually beyond, because, you know, now it's much broader, they're just mm -hmm. terrific. They're lovely people. And I'm just so thrilled that I have this relationship with them. So, oh, that's so great. My mom, uh, I wanted her to listen to you. So my mom's 81. I, so yesterday I said, Mom, May's on right now. Just take a listen. And she really loved how when somebody has a request, how you they you know they'll say oh it's my husband it's our anniversary and you take it one step further and you're like you it is like how many years have you guys been married this is amazing and where did you get married and like you actually take an interest you don't just say well that's great okay 20 years whoop here's the song <laughs> you know like you really so you know i think it's so nice you add something special and you just sparkle I, yeah. yeah you're amazing right back at you monica <laughs> All right, I'm going to put you back in the virtual green room. Absolutely. And, uh, we will see you. I'll come back to you in just a minute. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, May. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you guys, thank you so much for joining today. May Potts, amazing woman, so much to share about her career. I found that very, very inspiring. And uh, once again, I'm living a teenage dream over here uh, on the Get to Know Her show. So thank you for joining me today. Make sure you check out brendabadome.com and use the coupon code Get to Know Her for 21% off of your order. And if you still need to get some of our beautiful pride earrings, you can do that at glamjewels.com and we will see you guys back here next week thank you so much keep on showing the world your sparkle and if you're watching this on youtube subscribe bye for now